From TE Connectivity, this is Maker to Maker, conversations between engineers about engineering and the beautifully messy process that is design. I'm your host, Brooke Glassman, and today I'm talking with mechanical engineer at Neuro, Ryan McIntosh. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So first, I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so uh, I'm a mechanical engineer working at uh, Neuro, which is a uh, robotics company making autonomous delivery robots. And uh, I'm working on the sensor team there um, on various different projects. Awesome. First, I want to talk a little bit about how you ended up in engineering. Yeah, so I was always just kind of a, a tinkerer as a kid and, and loved to just take things apart and see how they worked. I had recently, um, kind of at the end of high school, taken up cycling and had a ton of passion for that in, at a hobbyist level uh, and saw just how much potential there was for engineering to happen within that hobby. Um, I had a professor my freshman year show us a bike and say everything, almost everything you learn in the mechanical engineering program is in this single object. You have heat transfer, you have uh, design, you have fluids in your brake lines with hydraulics, stuff like that. There's so much to learn even within an object that you would think is relatively simple. Um, so I kind of saw that as an opportunity to, um, to jump into kind of entry-level engineering roles. I would be just fueled by my passion for the sport. My following uh, internship in my sophomore year of college was at this uh, manufacturer called Vintage Electric um, that actually made and built electric bicycles. They're really cool. You guys should definitely check them out. Um, they're designed to look like old board track motorcycles. And um, there I was doing like a lot of mechanical design um, and just getting more hands-on with what it it's, means to be an engineer in that kind of a setting. I think that's awesome that you kind of saw the biking industry, which was something you were passionate about, as a bridge to outer space. I mean, those are <laughs> seemingly very different, at least on the surface. And initially, I wouldn't necessarily think like, oh, bikes next step rockets yeah so what was the bridge that you initially saw was it just the experience because of all the mechanical elements in the bike that you thought would really build your resume so that it would allow you to jump to something like outer space next my professor pointed out how many different uh kind of fields of engineering or kind of principles of mechanical engineering are housed within that bike i've met several mechanical engineers that work at bike companies, uh, and they are wildly talented, uh, especially in the field now of, of material science and like working with composites. Um, there's a nice crossover in a, a emphasis on weight in both bike design and aerospace, where you're absolutely fixated on making that design as light and efficient as possible while still maintaining some factor of safety and that really helped a lot to just understand those ideas at a, uh, a working level. Uh, and obviously I was getting some of that experience from my college education as well but doing it in the industry uh, really helped a lot. Yeah and you always gain a better understanding I feel like when you're hands-on doing it for yourself. So let's talk a little bit about NASA because you did have an internship there. Can you tell us a little bit about your role and what you did at NASA, maybe what you learned? I was an intern there um, and kind of worked with two separate projects, um, but that were focused on the same um, overall arching um, project. So we were working on this facility called uh, Leaf Light, which is a um, laboratory that was being developed to test the radiative heat capacity of heat shield tiles that are eventually going to be used on the Orion re-entry capsule. This is all part of the mission to the moon and eventually Mars. And um, we're realizing that re-entry speed, or I wasn't realizing this, but prior to me, um, the re-entry speeds are much greater coming back from Mars than we had seen from, from Apollo or um, Mercury or Gemini programs. So they needed to, to assess radiative heat um, as well as conductive as we're re-entering Earth's atmosphere. 
and uh, a whole new laboratory was needed to set up uh, needed to be set up to, to analyze this because previous test facilities at um, what's called the ArcJet facility at NASA Ames in Mountain View, uh, California, were all plasma based and very much not testing radiative heat. Basically, what we uh, had laid out was a, a lab that uses high power lasers all collimated together to hit a single heat shield tile with just immense amount of laser power um, and we assess how long different materials could withstand um, this this laser beam. So what I was working specifically on this is helping out with some of the mechanical design um, and submitting drawings, stuff like that um, for the lab and then also helping to test some, some of the logic behind the safety systems um, of the lab that were all um, run off of a PLC. During that process of helping design that lab and helping with some of the mechanical aspects, were there any challenges you had to overcome or hurdles you encountered that you didn't initially anticipate? We had four 50 kilowatt lasers um, all combined into one 200 kilowatt beam. That is a lot of power and there are <laughs> a lot of safety implications that follow um, that. We had to think of every possible failure mode uh, to ensure that this beam wasn't just going to be shot out into the middle of the NASA Ames <laughs> campus uh, and possibly hurting someone. Um, so, you know, there's even things like we had to account for seismic activity because if we suddenly misaligned the beam because the ground was shaking um, and it was firing off in a, a, a Precedented direction uh, that could be a real safety concern. So, a problem. you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you wouldn't think of, you know, earthquakes being a huge concern in most design applications, but in this, where the, the result of failure is major harm or even death to, to an individual, it's uh, definitely something you have to account for. Every kind of safety mechanism both in the mechanical designs in terms of like designing cooling uh, apparatuses, designing the room itself to withstand a certain amount of direct contact with one of these beams, um, but also in the, the logic of how the system interacted with uh, users and all the safety um, processes that are put in place. There is a lot uh, more to account for than I would have ever imagined coming into this project. So at NEO, you you had a lot of projects, I guess, you were working on, but one of them uh, involved braking, and it was something that you ulti ultimately got a patent for. Could you tell us a little bit about the design of that braking system and how you contributed to it? Yeah, so the San Jose office of NEO, where I worked at, was focused a lot on R&D projects, and they uh, had a ton going on. That's, that's why I was able to work on so many different things. Um, and one of them was braking. So I was, I was on the chassis team at NEO and worked on steering uh, systems, helped with some suspension stuff, and uh, was working on this braking project. We were basically trying to develop a mechanism that would simulate pedal feel and braking responsiveness um, that you would expect in a passenger vehicle with a traditional brake booster and hydraulic lines fed into each of the, the uh, brake calipers but without all of that stuff. Um, basically, the, the pedal arm was detached from the brake booster, and we had to replicate that feeling so that uh, the occupant of the vehicle wasn't pushing up against some super flimsy feeling pedal arm that would completely rob them of any confidence in how their braking is gonna work. Um, it's not a reassuring feeling if you're not getting any feedback from that. We, we had to basically model what that uh, force curve looked like uh, that you would see from a hydraulic system using other mechanisms. Um, after some different tests, we ended up going with basically a traditional like spring and damper to give us the general curve. From there, we added in a, a motor at the pivot point of the, the brake lever arm to fine tune the feel of the pedal. Um, and with those two mechanisms working together, you could make a very close approximation to what most 
car's brake pedal feel feels like. But with the addition of the motor, you actually now have the added flexibility of changing what that curve looks like in different scenarios. So you can stiffen up your braking or soften it depending on the situation or just the driver's preference. So they might be coming from a much smaller car that has less brake pedal force um, to, to get it to come to a full stop or from something like an F-150 or, or a much bigger vehicle that they're used to really jamming on the brake pedal. It's interesting how important ergonomics and customer perception really is in every industry and trying to make it so the driver feels comfortable and reassured and confident is a very important part of the job. Did you get to do any of the, the testing for it? Were you one of the people kind of checking the feel of it and making sure it felt natural? Yeah, no, what you're saying is, is totally accurate, especially within the automotive world where pe everyone pretty much has a car and people are very accustomed to certain aspects of that vehicle down to even like there's engineers working on the sound of the door closing the clo like closures engineers that are dedicated to making that sound exactly right and even if in like certain brands they'll have certain sounds that they're striving for jeep being a, a common one that people point to it's very mechanical sounding and that's important to the brand that it feels and sounds that way um, but that applies to steering and braking systems and suspension systems as well. Um, so some OEMs like BMW have very stiff steering and people expect it to feel that way. Whereas others like Toyota, it's much softer and that's what the customer buys that vehicle for. It's their own preference. So matching that is really important. And uh, we spent a ton of time on test tracks trying to get that feel. And it's actually kind of surprising how much is perception based. Um, you can get, you know, do all the, the analysis and, you know, set everything up based off of that. But there is a human element in the design of, of chassis systems where it just feels right. And that's something that is really like hard for a new engineer to, to perceive because, you know, I haven't driven as many cars as some of my coworkers. <laughs> So just like even getting to be in, in the vehicle as they're feeling it and then jumping in the driver's seat to try to like understand what uh, some of my coworkers were talking about was a really interesting experience. I, I learned a lot about how um, a car, like how, how people's preferences play into the design of, of the car. The details are, are everything. And I feel like that r the feeling of it being just right can be a bit hard to maybe even quantify. Uh, which as an engineer, I feel like is like a hard, hard thing to deal with if you can't really measure that and everyone's yeah. a little bit different. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Uh, you want to put a number on it just because yeah. that's what you're trained to do. But sometimes, yeah, you got to go off of uh, just the subjective feeling. Right. So you've also talked a little bit about how being part of industries and companies that you believe have are making a positive impact on the world. What, why does the vision and mission around electric vehicles and kind of even the company Neuro that you're at right now, why does that excite you? At an early stage of pursuing mechanical engineering, there is this kind of realization I had that it's, I've, I was very fortunate in that I've picked a career path that gives me a lot of ability to help people and help the world and create things that can make lives better and the planet healthier. Um, and I saw that as a really powerful tool that could be leveraged to make a difference. I, I was very adamant that I didn't want to have a career that didn't mean anything um, and, and didn't leave a positive impact in, in its wake. So um, focusing on companies that I thought were making a difference in a, a positive way has always been very top of mind for me when I'm choosing or trying to interview places and, and expressing interest in different uh, career opportunities. So when NEO came along and it was electric vehicles, it was emerging technology, everything just kind of came together um, in a really meaningful way for me where I saw how big a difference uh, I was able to, to make 
especially it being um, based in China and the Chinese government pushing really hard to, to uh, get electric vehicles on the road um, to try to cut emissions. And um, I think being a part of that was really inspiring to me. I, I felt like, okay, I, I'm seeing that kind of perception that I have of engineering in like coming to, to fruition. So that was a really big moment for me. Yeah, absolutely. And the topic of preserving our earth and may, and cutting emissions, like you said, is something that has been talked about a lot recently and is definitely a hot topic where where we're focusing a lot of our time and resources on. So being part of a company that is looking to do that is powerful and it, it's exciting. And I think the way you influence people and you get people dedicated to a cause is by that mission and that vision, which it certainly sounds like Neo has. After Neo, you're now at Neuro. And Neuro is also an innovative company that is looking to make a difference in the world through their products. Tell us a little bit more about Neuro as a company and maybe their mission and vision. Neuro is a robotics company first and foremost, but kind of the first foray into that um, and their first project, which drew me to working for them, um, is this autonomous delivery robot that drives on roads. Um, it's fully electric, so it's kind of playing into the whole green um, vision. <laughs> Basically designed to reduce the amount of cars on the road that are, are running errands. When I, when I joined, there is this stat that blew my mind um, that the, the founder shared with us, which was 45% of vehicles on the road to today are just running errands. It's not commuters. They're not freight or anything. It's just people running errands to and from the store. Um, and the idea of replacing a majority of that traffic with green electric vehicles that are fully autonomous and designed to be incredibly safe for the people that they operate around um, just seemed like an incredible mission to me. Um, the whole goal of Neuro is to give people time back and remove their uh, necessity to have to go to the store and run errands. It's not something I don't think most people like doing to begin with, <laughs> um, but also just to make roads safer by designing a vehicle specifically with the goal of protecting exterior occupants or exterior uh, pedestrians and cyclists and uh, other drivers um, using and leveraging autonomy, but also mechanical design. If um, you look at the neuro vehicle, it's very much designed so that it will protect everyone around it and sacrifice itself. It's like basically a big issue with autonomy and autonomous cars that have passengers is you create a bit of a trolley problem. And in that, uh, you have to make a decision if you're in a very dire situation you have a occupant or a passenger or, or sorry, a, a pedestrian or another car that you have to protect. Whereas we can always just self-sacrifice the vehicle and make drastic uh, maneuvers that you couldn't do with a, a passenger um, in it. So that those things all combined together really inspire me and drew me into to the vision that, that Neuro had. That's a very interesting point that you bring up and safety is a huge concern and priority, especially for autonomous vehicles. And I know the other day we talked a little bit about how in these emerging fields, there's not really rules or laws or codes written quite yet that specifically dictate what or how you're supposed to do something. So in one sense, you do have a lot of power and influence as an engineer on on how we're developing that field and how we're how you're going to make an impact on how people and these autonomous vehicles interact with each other but what from your point of view are kind of the challenges that you've seen and you've run into and maybe some of the ethical questions you're dealing with i i definitely think that there is uh you know a reasonable concern there um in certain applications um but 
in in Nero's case, and and in certain others as well, uh, we're not actually replacing a job in this particular application. We're we're removing a chore that people have uh, that they're not getting paid for. They're they're basically driving to and from the store. No one's paying them to do it. They just have to to get their produce or their prescriptions or whatever it may be. There was a study done that actually is is predicting that we'll be creating a lot of jobs to help support this robotic fleet um, uh, rather than taking them away. I, I wouldn't say that applies to every application of robots, but oftentimes there's a lot of people needed with skilled jobs to manage that fleet and maintain them and help um, just operations in general. It's definitely something that's very top of mind and there, I, I would say I'm pretty moderate when it comes to AI application. Uh, I, I think that there's a ton of good that it can do um, in a lot of different fields where it can be used to, to have a positive impact, but it definitely um, needs to be carefully monitored. Absolutely. And like you said, there are a lot of fields that AI can affect for sure, whether it's medicine or manufacturing, agriculture, marketing, which we see in play a lot even now, um, our military and outer space, and like you said, everyday activities like driving. As we look towards the future, are there any technological developments that you're most excited to see unfold in this field? Very biased opinion, but I am really excited to see autonomous cars uh, really start to develop and, and take off. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how people interact with them um, on the road. Uh, I, th I would say that's a very unknown at this point. There are lots of autonomous cars driving um, in certain cities, but it's still a very nascent industry. Um, and there's often safety drivers that are present for those situations that can help mitigate any issues that come up. So um, I think it'll be really interesting to see that. And I'm excited for having safer roads eventually. Um, there's just an obscene number of traffic related deaths every single year. And cutting that back um, in any way we can, I think is an incredible opportunity, um, especially being a cyclist myself. Right. <laughs> I'm very conscious of other cars on the road maybe not being aware of me because they're distracted or whatnot. So having a vehicle that has however many sensors, most of which are hopefully detecting me, um, <laughs> is, is really uh, great to, to feel that sense of reassurance as I'm out there. Yeah, so this topic is obviously very hot right now. And two of the five books on Bill Gates' recommended list for the year have a premise based on robot robotics and artificial intelligence. It's also trending in the movie and television industry, and there are different interpretations and fictional worlds that these writers create, and they do get the public talking about what's next. Um, and in a lot of cases, robots and artificial intelligence are depicted in a negative light, kind of as we were saying before. So can you just talk a little bit about some more of the good you believe artificial intelligence can do for the future of humanity instead of maybe destroying it like they talk yeah. about in some movies. No, definitely. I think that uh, there are a lot of examples um, of how it can be used positively. Um, medicine being the, the one that is kind of jumps to my mind most immediately. Um, if you're familiar with the Watson, IBM Watson, now, there were some early trials um, that I was reading about that w that was used for to try to diagnose patients. Um, and there was, I think, some mixed results with how that uh, worked out in, in real life applications, but it's important to realize that at the stage of that um, testing, AI was very early on. Um, so I think there's immense room to grow there. And just the thought that some AI can pull from every single research paper ever written, uh, every study ever conducted, even ones that just wrapped up maybe a week before, um, and can collect all that knowledge into one central location and use that and leverage that to diagnose a patient with maybe some 
very obscure sickness um, and very uh, minor symptoms. Um, that's incredible. It's something that is uh, virtually impossible for most medical professionals to keep up with that amount of material. Um, and they, if that can work in conjunction with a medical professional, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Use, using AI to manage a lot of big data applications um, in the space uh, and aerospace sector especially um, for analyzing you know, tons of different signals um, and data collected from satellites and telescopes um, to try to you know, identify other planets that we could possibly uh, settle on or you know, various asteroids that may be contain precious metals or something like that. There's just so much opportunity here where you're basically taking the abilities of an individual to analyze something and exploding that to just incomprehensible levels um, and you leveraging that to solve really comp complex problems. Between, like you said, the electric vehicles, medicine, outer space, all of those applications can be really positive and lead to so many more discoveries um, and potentially save a lot of lives. So that is all pretty impactful. Do you feel like your experience thus far between the, the, the bikes, NASA, NEO, Neuro, do you feel like it's given you a deeper appreciation for not only engineering, but maybe our planet and our place in the universe? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a lot of appreciation for our planet. Uh, I'm very like uh, much an outdoorsy person. Um, and I love spending time outside and doing everything I can to try to preserve that and for future generations uh, is, is really important to me. So um, that's, I think, why I have always wanted to work for companies that are very much keeping that in their mission statements and they're progressing towards the same kind of goals. But also, um, yeah, understanding that you know, other planets do present a lot of opportunity and seeing how we can expand and maybe offload some of the mining or something uh, that we do on Earth to, to uh, asteroids, for example, um, I think would help play into that, that mission where we're generally done tapping into the Earth's uh, resources on the level that we are and working towards eliminating um, a lot of the more high pollution activities that uh, humans are doing on Earth and offloading that to, to other celestial bodies. I, I think that's an incredible vision for the future um, that hopefully we can, we can eventually reach. Absolutely. Something I, I asked someone on the last podcast and I think is something I kind of want to ask all of, all of the people that we get on the show is what would you say your X factor is that has made you a successful engineer that you are today and really separates you from everyone else? I uh, honestly would, I think my passion for what I do is something that really helps me. I really like engineering and I love the, the work that I get to do. I feel very fortunate to work at the places I work at and work on the projects I'm on. So I come to each of those scenarios with a lot of energy and um, drive to try to solve the problems that uh, I'm, I'm assigned to. So um, I think that that's something that I, I understand completely not everyone has that opportunity and I feel incredibly grateful for that aspect of, of the career that I've led so far. Um, it, it makes it so easy to wake up and come to work when you are absolutely stoked on the, the work that you're doing. Um, so I think that's probably the, the biggest thing that I realize I'm, I don't share with everyone else. I feel like you can even hear just the excitement and passion in your voice as you're, <laughs> as you're answering the question. Uh, so I think that's that's a great answer. And I do agree and believe that the more passionate and excited you are about something, it's easier to to learn about it, too. Like you're more you're just more interested. You're more dedicated. Your heart's in it. 
And that's also something you can't really quantify, but it's this really unique and special thing to have in an employee and just a person is someone who is just happy and excited and you know it makes you want to learn a bit more and it does sound like your experience really early on you know has helped you so much down the line how do the fundamentals of cycling play into your engineering philosophy cycling really gave me a lot of mechanical aptitude Uh, I work on all my own bikes, but I also worked as a mechanic. I even taught a class on bike maintenance when I was in college. And just having that hands-on opportunity to work on something gave me a lot of understanding when I'm designing things of how, you know, these kinds of systems interact, um, how heat is transferred into brake pads and how you can add on, you know, uh, cooling fins to help dissipate that, how a belt drive or a chain can transmit power and how those components wear over time. It's like the more nuanced aspects of mechanical design that I think I've really gained a better understanding from uh, by being more hands-on and like touching bolts and like applying torques and stuff like that, where I can like kind of understand what a five Newton meter torque feels like on a bolt when I'm specking that for a completely different design. It's that kind of thing where you're not completely disconnected from what you're designing. Uh, you, you have a better physical understanding of that. And I think that's, that's helped a lot, especially with like interacting with people who do like machinists who are making those parts and not coming to them with this kind of uh, this uh, mindset that's been formed in a vacuum without ever interacting with stuff like that. It's kind of like you've gone to calibrate yourself. So exactly. like you said, you, ca- you kind of know what it feels like for five Newtons or whatever you're, try- you're trying to tighten the bolt to. So you're calibrated to the bike and the, and the industry quite a bit. Do you feel like being an engineer has, has given you a, ne- a unique perspective on just the world? as a whole? Yeah, I think that I apply engineering principles to every kind of problem I face in the world of just like the process of defining the problem, like understanding constraints and coming up with solutions to that. The early like early design process, I think is super applicable to everything that you would encounter, even if it's totally unrelated to engineering. And I think that helps me solve all kinds of problems even if it's like back to being in the outdoors if i'm like trying to navigate and uh, maybe there's like a water source that's dried up i'll frame the problem um, in a way that is very methodical and like engineering like where okay we're here we need to be here let's look for other water sources stuff like that it could be like a wildly un engineering related problem um, that that I can still apply those those concepts to. So I think it's been useful in the sense that I can define problems um, better than I might have been able to had I not pursued this career. That that example is interesting because I feel like I start thinking about some of our ancestors who engineering wasn't a thing back then, but surviving kind of is and solving those problems. Like you said, at the end of the day a lot of it's problem solving and it's how you frame a problem how and how you go about it and how you think about solutions. So even our earliest ancestors to some degree were, were problem solvers, which is essentially yeah. one of the big things about engineers. Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue that they are somewhat engineers in like the design of primitive tools and stuff like that and solving problems and making something to help them overcome those those challenges. Uh, I would definitely argue that that's an early form of engineering. I love the perspective and thanks for joining. You were awesome to talk to. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. That was great. Thank you for joining us. Please come back next time by subscribing to the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Until next time, think big, move fast, and make every connection count.